My only goal in the NHL is, is to win the Stanley Cup. There's not a player in the NHL that doesn't dream about that. It's huge because it's the last goal that I have left in the NHL at this point in time in my career is to win a Stanley Cup on another hockey team. When I grew up in Russia, but I didn't know too much about the uh, Stanley Cup. You can't get so, so many chances to win. The pinnacle of a, a professional hockey player is the Stanley Cup, and probably it's the most difficult uh, trophy in all in all of sports. The New York Rangers, haunted for 54 years by visiting city chants of 1940 and the reality that it's been a lifetime for most since the Rangers last won the coveted Stanley Cup. Talk of curses and hexes since 1941 when Red Dutton's rival New York Americans were forced out of Madison Square Garden. Dutton vowing the Rangers would never win another Stanley Cup in his lifetime. As far as all these uh, curses and that, I don't believe in that kind of nonsense, but uh, I feel sorry for the fans. I hope they get their wish pretty soon. They've got good depth. They've got good speed, and I'd say this is the best chance to win this uh, Stanley Cup since maybe 1940. The fact that there is some history here from 1940, I think it only enhances the, the excitement about the prospects of success, and I think the team is feeding off of that. All cities want their team to win, obviously, but this has become uh, uh, city-possessed. Uh, that 1940 looms so big in everybody's craw, and... Uh, and uh, we hope that it's, uh, it's a pressure that uh, may come to play against uh, the actual players. There's something very, very special about the New York Ranger fan base. My name is Anthony Sinkew. Rich Sherman. It's Mark Weissman. I believe it's the most passionate of all fan bases. David Zaretsky. Matt Steinberg. Joe Ryder. Peter Catalano. We are like sheep. Buy our tickets. We go every year. We think this is our year. I've been a season ticket holder since 1972. 1978. Been a season ticket holder since 1988. Every year, we think we're going to win the Stanley Cup. Paul Spinoza, Richard Spinoza, Section 334. Section 405. Section 411, Row A, 15. And all the frustration that we have endured as a fan base. You know, you kind of commiserate together and you become one. I've been a Ranger fan since 1953. 1979 when I was four years old. Since 1979. Been a fan my entire life. And that's what we are. We're a mob mentality. It's a great thing to get a player like Mark Messier. The new coach of the New York Rangers, Mike Keenan. Ryan Blanton Leach. But my God, I, this team put us through the ups and downs. The pain and suffering of a Ranger fan goes deep and far. Every conversation about the Rangers involved the drought. It involved 52 years, 53 years, 54 years. You haven't won. The, the identity of your team is that you can't win or that they haven't won. Francis, big shot. Score! Right through Richter. For one reason or another, and it just became this ongoing thing where these bizarre circumstances um, would take over the team and they, and they wouldn't go as far as people had hoped or expected. There's two variations on the curse. One was the Rangers management burned the MSG mortgage in the Stanley Cup after they won in 1940 and the hockey gods got upset and cursed the Rangers to never win again at that point. The second part, uh, the, the other side of that curse was that Red Dutton, the player, owner, manager of the New York Americans, which was the first team at the Garden, the first hockey team, they were eventually forced out by the Rangers when the Rangers came on the scene and became more popular. And when the team folded up operations in 1942, supposedly Red Dutton cursed the Rangers, blamed them for the misfortunes of the Americans, and said, I hope they never win another Stanley Cup in my lifetime. You always knew the curse was there, but you always believed you could always beat the curse, but you just never could. But being a Ranger fan is always being an eternal optimist. So you always thought, this will be the year, this will be the year, until it wasn't, and then it's going to be next year, because what else could you do? And he does a little dance to celebrate. Now it's time for the As 
as a player, you try not to play junior GM too much, and you don't really want to rest the possibility of success on this savior that may or may not come. But there were rumors that Mark Messier was going to come. I just think the whole thing really appealed to me at that time. Born and raised in Edmonton, we had won five cups, I was 30 years old. And if I was going to make a change, why not make a change that really made sense to me, not only from a professional standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint, to be able to grow even more as a person, and as well as taking on one of the biggest challenges that perhaps was presented in the National Hockey League. Now, it wasn't a unanimous approval. There were some people that felt that Mark Messier might be over the hill, that he had run his course in Edmonton. And I think the way people perceive this acquisition was they're getting the aura, they're getting the leadership, but they're not really getting an elite player anymore. And really in the context of Ranger acquisitions, it was the only reasonable perception because they never got guys in their prime. They would always get the guy one year too late. When it became evident that the Rangers were in the hunt to get Messier, uh, I called John Davidson, and my concern was that, you know, if they get Marc Messier, is this going to be Guy Lafleur, Marcel Dion, even to a lesser extent, Phil Esposito? I mean, are they going down this road again? Well, he probably went into about a 10-minute filibuster on the phone. I didn't even get a word in. I just listened. By the end of that 10 minutes, I was ready to get in the car, drive to Edmonton, and drive Marc Messier back to New York with me. My boss, Stanley Jaffe, really wanted to do something with Messier to bring a whole new level to the Rangers. And I, I, of course, wanted to do it too. But of course, I was scared that if Mess couldn't play the way that I thought he could and was closer to the end than I thought he was, I'd be close to the end of my time at the Garden. When they were talking about making that move, uh, Neil Smith, and it wasn't, hey, what do you think of this deal? It was. He wanted to know about Mark and what I thought about uh, where he was at physically. And I said, there's not a pure skater. Messier in the corner! Scores! And mentally or physically, uh, there wasn't a tougher player in the league. I knew that we were very close to getting this done. And one of the last pieces of it would be for him to see our team doctor in New York. I called our doctor who was giving Mark the physical, and I'll never forget his words. I said to him, did you finish with the physical? He says, oh, yes. I said, how does he, how is he? And he says, oh, he's quite a specimen. And that was his exact quote, he's quite a specimen. And I was, gave myself a little mental fist pump and knew that then we would be announcing this trade the next morning. Just a great thing to get a player like Mark Messier with the New York Rangers. I don't think that the, the franchise has ever had a player like him. Half a dozen guys came up to ask me about him. Um, and certainly guys felt like they knew him because everyone admired him. And certainly for the young guys in their early 20s and that, they'd be growing up watching him with the Oilers. And there you see the tears of Mark Messier. Tears of happiness as the Oilers win the Stanley Cup. I'm just really looking forward to the challenge of coming to New York and starting a so-called uh, second career. And I'm every bit as confident the second career is going to be as good as the first one. Everyone was excited, uh, but there was also, you know, the air of what to expect. Here we go. I remember being in Montreal. I remember being on the training table getting treatment on my hip. And he came in and he goes, hey, what's going on? And I put my hand out and shook his hand. And went on the ice and we were skating around and Mark had about 15 feet on either side of him without a player near him. I can remember stretching along the boards the day after the game in Montreal and just he was talking to somebody and almost fell over my stick and I looked at James Patrick and I'm like you know that's all we need to do is bump into this guy you know it'd be like taking Superman out. I was with James Patrick skating around the opposite side of the ice looking across and I said to James, I said, can you believe Mark Messier is on our team? And he shook his head. He goes, I keep saying the same thing. I keep saying the same thing. And we do our laps and he's checking out his new equipment, but it's the same look. His pants fit the same way. The jersey fits over his shoulder pads the same way. It's definitely Mark Messier. And yet he's got the Ranger practice sweater on. One of the things they had talked about was who was going to be the captain. You know, there was a lot of really good people in that room, and, and, and I think that uh, once that trade was made, 
I think it, there was no doubt who our leader was going to be. Welcome live to Madison Square Garden. It's the home opener for the New York Rangers. The Rangers will have Mark Messier in the lineup wearing number 11. A five-time Stanley Cup champion wearing uniform number 11, Mark Messier. When he stepped on the ice, the building was, you know, it was in a shambles and it was loud and, you know, it was game on. Messier to Carter. Covered every sport as a beat, and I have never, ever seen anybody who leads men the way this guy does. I think from day one, Mark established himself as a guy that we all looked up to. Mark Messier scores! Mark had won before. He knew some of the little things that make a team a little closer together. And all those things, just a little bit at a time, a little bit out of time. And the next thing you know is you look to him in every situation. And it was just such a good fit for all of us. He was excited to lead, and we were certainly ready to take his word as gospel. Before Mark came in, it felt like there was a curse and you didn't really want to talk too much about the cup. And when Mark came in, he said, no, this is what we're here for. He was willing to talk about how many years it had been and that he had come here to do this thing. You put on the jersey, you get the legacy. And Mark was willing to take all of that on. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to get the expectations up too high in case they were let down. But if your expectations aren't high, and you don't feel a letdown, you don't feel bad about losing, then you're never going to try to achieve what you want to do. You know, it's funny. To me, well, the team concept of not being able to produce a championship is one thing. But the thing that blew my mind, and this is from a little kid up until at that time, I'm talking like early 30s, late 20s, was that this was a team that never finished at first, didn't have like a leading scorer, didn't have a Norris Trophy winner. How you can go all these years and not have any success on an individual level, on a team level, to me that was like more mind-boggling about it. And then that first season, it was boom, boom, boom. Messier cuts in, he's got it, he scores! Just pedal to the metal, they were the number one seed. Standing ovation at the garden. We didn't see a cup. But I saw an MVP Hart Trophy Award win I'd never seen. Mark Messier, New York. I saw a Norris Trophy winner in Brian Leach. I saw a, a division championship and an overall league championship for the best team in the league. The President's Trophy. So right off the bat there, he just like rewrote the current history in one season. That team probably, they were capable of winning the Stanley Cup, but they were derailed uh, in the playoffs in a very controversial series with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Messier is there, he's got it, he's tied up by Murphy, a shot, score! The Rangers should have won that series. And I think everybody, Messier included, realized after that unsuccessful 91-92 year that this was not going to be easy. I keep telling the fans in New York to be patient, we're gonna win the Stanley Cup, but I don't think they really like the patient part too much, so I, <laughs> I don't think I can really get by and tell them to be patient. Messier knew that you know winning Stanley Cups wasn't easy. Yes, I won five cups in seven years, but it took us a long time to do it. It'll happen, it's just not going to happen overnight. Sometimes you have to suffer a little pain to, to get to the end result, and that was one of those times. While Mark Messier's first season in a Rangers uniform gave long-suffering fans cause for hope, the team would take a giant step backwards the following year. Our expectations for the 92-93 season were very, very high and should have been. We were a good team. But there were plenty of uh, cracks in our armor, and I think they really were apparent fairly early. We got off to a poor start, and then you start reading everything. You, you know, they're too old now, and Mess and Roger weren't getting along, and things started to snowball. It was clear that the captain, who was the unquestioned leader of the hockey operation at that point, didn't really believe in the coach. You're talking about two very different individuals and two individuals who are very strong in their beliefs but have much different outlooks on how to accomplish something. Mark had been through being part of five Stanley Cup champion teams and he knew what it took to win a Stanley Cup. Roger 
didn't know what it took to win a Stanley Cup because he hadn't won one. Today I would like to announce that the New York Rangers have relieved uh, Roger Nielsen of his coaching duties. Ron Smith is now being named interim head coach of the New York Rangers. The 92-93 season was, I would probably use the word disgrace. To not make the playoffs was so gut-wrenching and brutal. I remember sitting at the last home game with a couple of friends of mine and the, the crowd booed through most of that game. <laughs> I went to the game, and, and afterwards, I kind of I hung out um, at, outside the play-by-play -play club. And I, you know, remember distinctly Messier coming through the elevator and shaking his hand. He kind of looked in our eyes, and we were just, you know, a bunch of fans, kids mostly. And, and Messier actually apologized to us. And you did see it in his eyes, and you saw it in his face. And he was just very unhappy, and things were going to change the following year. Last night at about 10.30 uh, or 10.35, the 1992-93 uh, New York Rangers season ended. And this morning with this announcement, the New York Rangers 1993-94 season begins. They needed somebody to come in and instill discipline in the locker room who was not going to be their buddy, who was not going to be a friend, who was going to hold them accountable, not only for their actions in games, but in practice and in meetings and making sure that they understood that they were here to do a job. And the three names that I came up with who could do that for us were Scotty Bowman, but he was in in Pittsburgh, Al Arbor, but he was a vice president for the Islanders. He went back to coaching after that. And Mike Keenan, and Mike Keenan was the only one of the three that were available, so we better go get him before somebody else does. I introduce to you the new coach of the New York Rangers, Mike Keenan. Keenan was our guy. We needed to go get Keenan. Uh, he was the, the missing piece to this puzzle. And um, I started calling for Keenan. I used to call the, the fan up, you know, 12 o'clock at night and say, listen, Mike Keenan's our guy. You got to go get him. I don't care. And, you know, one day it happens. I thought he was crazy, just so you know. Keenan was not the best coach to hire if you were looking for a kissy, feely, long-term relationship. I liked his style of hockey. It was in your face. It was a grind. It was relentless. It was, we're going to push you, and if you push back, we push you harder. I'm extremely proud of the fact that I'm now a New York Ranger. I feel that I've prepared my entire life for this moment. A big city was not intimidating to me or the fact that I was going to coach the New York Rangers. One of the reasons that Neil was perhaps uh, excited about having me here is that I've been stamped a winner. On each and every team that he had coached before, he had conflicts with his players and he had confrontations with them. I think discipline is very much part of the process. You heard all the stories about Mike and how he ran the ship. It was going to be his way or the highway. Whatever they think of Mike and his coaching methods, they deserved Mike Keenan at the end of that 92-93 season, and they knew it. Our workouts over the summer were harder. There was nothing taken for granted. Nobody knew whether their position was safe. The practices were the most high-paced that I've ever been a part of before. There was no stopping between drills. There was no three-quarter speed. Keenan was very thoughtful on the message he delivered, the effect it would have on the team, how people would view him within the locker room and without. There was something that was different, but I would say by the time training camp was over, it was exciting. I thought the practices were excellent. You know, looking back, a lot of his rants, what he said, when he pulled you, how he responded to questions was all orchestrated for effect, which manipulation, whatever you want to call it, it, it definitely worked. The first day of training camp, he showed the Miracle Mets parade down uh, the Canyon of Heroes, put some pictures up of the Stanley Cup in the room. You have to have a vision and you have to know, have a purpose to achieve what you want to do. And Mike was really responsible for starting that whole psyche. I tried to set a tone and set the team on a mission and, and at the same time continue to establish that goal, that single-minded goal, and that was to win the Cup. He wasn't afraid to talk about winning the Stanley Cup, which I think in the Rangers' history, nobody wanted to discuss it. It was a curse. And those dreaded words, you know, 1940. I'm extremely excited about the opportunity to meet something that hasn't been met here in, what is it? 1940.
the only reason I came to New York was to win a Stanley Cup and to win it immediately. I had not yet met Mike at the time he'd been hired by the Rangers. However, almost immediately thereafter, I worked with him because we broadcast the 1993 Stanley Cup final together for NHL radio. Now, we had breakfast at the um, Stanley Cup headquarters, and they had all the trophies lined up in the lobby of the hotel. The Stanley Cup, all of the other trophies, the Ross, the Hart, the Norris. And I spent my 45 or so respectful seconds and then was ready to move on. And I start walking, and I look back, and there's Keenan. He's still looking at the cup. And he's, I'm telling you, he's fixed on it. He's catatonic. He's just staring at the thing. He's not moving. He's not emoting, not expressing at all. Finally, I had to say, one of these days, huh? And Mike looks at me, and he says, you're effing right one of these days. There were events earlier in the season that uh, uh, certainly I pushed the players emotionally, psychologically, physically, uh, intellectually, uh, that they had to again embrace a level of excellence that is not normal. It's an early season game against the expansion Anaheim Ducks. It should be a slam dunk Ranger win. To win in the National Hockey League, to win a Stanley Cup in the National Hockey League, uh, does not require normal behavior. It's abnormal behavior. You know, it was just one of those games where uh, you got a new team that comes into MSG and uh, is excited, and, you know, we just didn't play very well. We just did not uh, execute. Very excited. Here's a chance for Terry Yates, and he scores! Uh, Rangers just looked lethargic, would, would be the best way to describe it. They weren't skating, they weren't hitting, uh, making too many mental errors. Didn't look like the team that was going to be a Stanley Cup contender, that's for sure. The open man is Terry Yates, who scores again! Oh. Mike just kind of pretty much was fed up. He starts screaming at the players that they're no good and they're not going anywhere, and this team isn't anywhere close to a cup. He stops coaching on the bench. He says, if you're not going to play, I'm not going to coach. I remember him just saying, excuse me, excuse me. Does anybody want to play here tonight? Anybody want to play? He pretty much threw it out at our skates and said, hey, you guys aren't playing? Well, you know what? Then I'm not going to coach. I mean, we pretty much changed our lines ourselves, and I had never seen a coach really do that. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah. People, they're, they're a hockey team, but they're named after a Disney movie. I, you know, this was about all that Mike Keenan could abide. Um, and so he threw a temper tantrum on the ice. I remember him looking at me. He's like, what, what happened to Brian Leach? Is, we, was Leach hurt? Yeah, it went, well, we had a view. Where, we had where a, is Leach? Yeah, we had a I'm, view. I'm looking on a bench. I don't, we have a perfect view. So where's Leach? Where's Leach? And I'm saying, yeah, Leach, is buried, Leach is buried next to the back of both. And he ain't playing Keen, anywhere. Keenan put him in the doghouse. I'm like, well, how could this be? How could you put Brian Leach there? And I says, he's not. Mike Keenan benched Brian Leach. Brian Leach and Jay Wells. I think he just had free license prior to my arrival in certain aspects of the game. I wanted to alter those, those instincts in his decision making about supporting the puck a little bit differently than he had. And, and I tried to verbalize it with him for an, a few games and a number of occasions. So finally I decided to bench him. And I benched him in New York and, and uh, asked him to respond when he felt he could embrace what we were trying to accomplish. And he was very stubborn and sat there for the most part of a game. In my mind, I was doing all I could uh, that Mike was asking, but it still couldn't really get to the level that he was looking for or that he was comfortable with. Uh, it wasn't a good feeling for me, but you know that was something that bothered me um, all year long, no question. And yeah, losing this one. Keenan's going to have to really sit down with Neil Smith and figure out exactly what's going on. This is very tough to accept. I mean, I remember that like it was yesterday. Keenan came in and pretty much verbatim said, Brian Leach, Brian Blank and Leach, Chris Chelios is way better than you are. I would trade him right now for you. 
This organization has you rated way too high. But I was friends with Chelly and we would talk and he'd be like, what's going on in New York? And I'd be like, what do you mean? What's Iron Mike up to? And he goes, I heard we're being traded for each other. That was the MO for Mike Keenan, trying to push the buttons to get the most out of a player. And uh, he knew that in order for the Rangers to be successful, he had to have Brian Leach playing at the highest level uh, that he could play. Well, the practice after was uh, a, a, an exclamation mark in terms of where we were at, in terms of our development and, and moving a program forward. We had a hard battle practice. We had to go up and down at least 45 or 50 times. I mean, it was one of those skates where, uh, you know, you had, uh, you felt like your legs were baggage claim for, uh, for, for 10 days. Yeah, I was very demonstrative in my approach to the practice. I physically pushed them. Uh, I remember breaking a stick over the goal. I'm sure it was a little scary for them to come in and this coach is demanding that not only are we going to make the playoffs, we're going to win the cup. So that's a that's a big jump. It was us against him mentality, and I really think that once we understood that, uh, I mean, we took off. But I really think that that 24-hour stretch of losing Anaheim and that bag skate the next day, uh, I thought was the turning point for us in the season. The Islanders weren't in existence when I became a Ranger fan in 1968, but when they finally came into existence, you know, it was, it was, it was great because we had, you know, two teams so close in proximity. When you're a startup team and you're going against an original six team, there's the big brother, little brother syndrome. And you could imagine if you were the Islanders starting out, if you could just overtake the Rangers, how great that would be for you as an organization. And then, lo and behold, come the 80s. It's all over. The New York Islanders go to the Stanley Cup final over the Rangers. And the 80s were like the dark era for the Rangers. It's four straight Stanley Cups for them. Four straight beatings of the Rangers. Watching the Islanders hoist and hold up the Stanley Cups with all those great teams just made it even that much more miserable for us Ranger fans. And there it is. The possession of the New York Islanders. It was the curse. Island fans loved ribbing Ranger fans and ribbing the Rangers about their inability uh, to win a cup in 54 years. And the Rangers couldn't win in the Nassau Coliseum. There's a, a game I remember actually going to at the Coliseum where the, the puck stopped 20 seconds into the game. So the scoreboard actually read, read 1940. And, you know, Islander fans, being Islander fans, they let the Rangers know. Uh, and the whole place was just yelling and screaming and chanting the, that famous 1940 chant. And, and there it was on the scoreboard. 1940, 1940. And you just get sick of it. It's like, enough is enough. I wasn't even born. No matter how well the Rangers were playing at any point in any of the five years before that, they could come in on a 10-game winning streak. They could have a 5 nothing lead at the end of the first period. And something would go horribly wrong in the second or third periods, and they would lose to the Islanders. And there was, at that point, still nothing worse than losing to the Islanders. But losing to the Islanders at the Coliseum was... Uh, I, I can't, I don't think there's any word in the dictionary that can describe the agony that you felt when they lost out there. When I would get in the elevator to go to a Rangers Islanders game, somebody would say, you have to win tonight, you have to win tonight. I'm on my way to work, so-and-so works, sits at the desk next to me. It's all I hear about, you have to win tonight. I can tell you that back in, in March of 94, it had really been a point of contention. It had gotten under the Rangers' skin that they had not won a game at the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum in nearly five years. So building up through that period of time, every time into the Coliseum felt like a playoff game. And tonight, these two teams, the New York Islanders and the New York Rangers, come calling at the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum. So it was important psychologically, get a win in their building before the damn playoffs start. And the game was back and forth and pucks bounced and really an ugly affair. And save the rebound, they score! 
I got yanked. Kielsen came in. 45 second mark of the second period. Mike Richter goes to the Ranger bench. And Glenn Healy, it would appear, is going to get an appearance here in front of the fans that love him. Well, you have to understand, Glenn, had played at the island in the year before, taking them to the um, conference finals. Here's Hogue centering off the side of the net, picks it up and scores! Benoit Hogue! Swifter looks like he's got his mask on and ready to return to the ice. Puts Healy back on the bench, and Richter back into the game. Keenan yanks him in front of his, what was his hometown the year before, and Glenn was really upset by that. I go back in, and Glennie coming to the bench, they, you know, told Mike and know in certain terms how he felt. I remember it involved body parts and where he could put certain things and all kinds of other things. With a minute and 27 seconds remaining in the hockey game, it's tied at four. It's tied, it's late in the third period, and as I recall, Sergei Zubov let go a shot from not too far inside the blue line. Centers back to Zubov, fires, he scores! I could see it in my head right now. Sergei Zubov, top of the slot, he gets a cross ice feed, one time slap shot, is down on his knees, and he's pumping his fists up in the air as the Rangers win for the first time in the Nassau Coliseum in what seemed like forever. And the Rangers, who had not won here since October 28th of 89, celebrate a come from behind 5 to 4 victory. Thank you, finally, you know, we did it. We uh, one hex down and one to go. Looking back on it, if you think of what the Rangers had to do to win the Stanley Cup, you would look at that game and say, okay, before the playoffs get started, we need to go to the Nassau Coliseum and win a game to just get rid of that part of the conversation. We don't want to hear any more about how you can't win in the Nassau Coliseum. So that was a logical thing that had to happen, and it did, but that's what that team was all about. The team was all about uh, looking at history and saying we don't care. discussion with Neil Smith previously to the season starting and I asked him what do you think of this team he said this team's capable of winning the Stanley Cup and I said Neil I, I hate to disappoint you but I've already been to the Stanley Cup final three previous times and this team doesn't have the ingredients to win the Stanley Cup and I'm not sure why you would even suggest that because they didn't have the ingredients to even make the playoffs in the previous season. Mike and I probably discuss players every day. I remember him at the practice rink wanting to have these sit-down meetings every day with league stats in our hand, and he'd want to go through all the teams and say, would you trade for him, would you trade for him, would you trade for him? At first I hated it because to me it was like, you know, rotisserie league stuff. We were in Calgary for the trading deadline and we had assembled as a group of coaches and managers and Neil and his personnel and I was really trying to persuade Neil that we had to make some changes. And Neil was very reluctant. He went back to the idea that we're in first place. Why would you want to upset this group? Mike had his own thoughts on how the team should be constructed, and so did Neil. And uh, Gikowski was the team president, and uh, we were trying to manage uh, Mike and uh, Neil. Bob Gikowski did a brilliant thing. A couple of days before the deadline, he brought them into a room together, and he basically read them both the riot act. He said, you two are our leaders. We're not gonna get anything done if you guys are on the same page. Niels looked at Mike and said, Mike, I will get you what you need. You have to tell me what you need. I knew the players that we wanted to trade for and they had to trust me. Neil had to trust me that I did know. They needed to get tougher. They needed to get grittier. They had plenty of talent to sacrifice for this. I'm actually at work, sitting at my desk and I'm listening to the radio. 3.55 comes, no trades. I called Jerry Cosby, Sporting Goods, Master Square Garden, because I had known that they were the ones that, you know, make the jerseys. If any new guys were coming in, they had to give an advance notice. And I knew uh, one of the workers there, Chief. And I asked Chief, anything brewing over in Rangerland? You know, are we making any trades or anything? And uh, he said, ah, oh, you know, I heard Amante might be traded, but nothing's concrete. I said, oh, come on, Chief. I said, Tony's not going nowhere. The trade market was busy, and the Rangers were the busiest. They made several deals, and a couple of big ones. 
Mike Keenan got two players from Chicago who he knows very well in Stefan Matteau, a big left winger, and Brian Noonan. Mike wanted those two players from day one. Every day we met, Mike just grabbed the uh, stats and kept saying, Matteau and Noonan, Matteau and Noonan, Matteau and Noonan. So I had been on the phone all year with Pulford asking about Matto and telling Mike Keenan that all he'll do for Matto is a Monte, and I'm not trading a Monte straight for Matto. Tony right away became a great player for us. His compete level was very high, his energy level was very high, and there were some games where we were out there and he was by far the best player on the ice. He's up the shot, he scores! Tony Amante! Finally, at the, at the deadline I got, Pulford to give us Brian Noonan with Matto. And that to me said, okay, you're getting a two for one. Um, now I can do it. Although I, I gotta tell you, and I've always said I didn't like it. I hated it. I couldn't believe they got rid of Tony. Out, out. I couldn't believe it. I said, who the heck is this Stefan Matto? Yeah, he's a big body, but what, what does he do? Brian Noonan, who, who are these guys? Muckers, grinders. Mike Gartner goes for Glenn Anderson, who's an owner of five Stanley Cup rings. Well, the Cup winning years certainly do make a difference, and Anderson has built up your reputation over the years as, as being a very, very solid playoff player. Mike Gartner was definitely one of my favorite players, and I was disappointed to hear him go. Score! Mike Gartner! Mike Keenan wasn't in love with Mike Gartner as a player and his chances of helping us win. He felt that we needed a different element than that. Guy scores 30 goals a year for 15 years straight. Never done it in the playoffs. All right, but still. Toronto had stumbled a little bit around the trading deadline. And I, I called Cliff and said, are you interested in Mike Gartner? He said, yes. He said, for who? And I said, well, how about Glenn Anderson? I had played with Glenn Anderson in, in Edmonton and I understood what a champion he was. Basically, when it comes down to the crunch time and you need a big goal, I raised my game to another level when it came to playoffs. And don't underestimate the acquisition of 35-year-old Craig McTavish, an excellent centerman, and right now the Rangers need some depth at center. I had asked Glenn Sather about McTavish all year long because I felt we needed a good third line, checking line, shutdown line, penalty killing, and face off man. McTavish with a draw. Lift the stick of Nylander, kick the puck back. I think we'll see a lot of McTavish using different ways of winning the face off. And at the last minute, we traded Todd Marchant to Edmonton for McTavish. That trade was another symbol to everybody that we are going to upgrade every level of this team from the first line to the fourth line. I remember looking at the paper the next day and seeing all the faces of the players that had been moved. It seemed like there were 10 pictures on the page about the amount of players coming and going for a team that was in first place. It was incredibly bold, it was incredibly daring, but this team was built for this one year. It's tough to go through trades like this when you lose real good people like Tony Amante and Mike Gartner, but the Rangers are a little bigger, they're a little grittier, and they're, in my opinion, the Rangers should be a better playoff team. I knew all these people would understand what they would be expected to commit to the group. He scores! Glenn Anderson! We needed that style of player. We needed that experience. In front, Matteau, he scores! Stefan Matteau! To take on our competitors in the Eastern Conference, first and foremost, even to get to the finals. Come on, buddy. Come on, boys. Yeah. At the 94 trade deadline, I'm working for the Daily News and I'm covering the Devils, and we're on the West Coast. The Rangers have beaten the Devils all five meetings. They're in first place overall. The Devils are the second best team, and they are really not doing anything, and why would they? They have a terrific team. And then the word starts to filter out. The Rangers are trading their young, fast players, their talent, their future, and they're bringing in these grizzled veterans. A lot of Devils players were visibly worried. They couldn't believe that this team that was clearly the class of the league was willing to rip up a quarter of their roster for this battle that was coming. It just made them understand how much the Rangers were going for it. The end of the season, we're obviously positioned pretty well. The team highly successful, very enthusiastic, great expectation for future success. The team had won the President's Trophy. I mean, uh, had accomplished everything there was to accomplish during the regular season. The only thing left was the playoffs. 20 years before I was born, so with that in mind, you, you put it in the past, and, and I think you, you ask anyone on the team, there's not a better place to play than New York and not a better organization than the Rangers.
The Rangers with an NHL best 112 points in the regular season open the playoffs against their arch rivals from Long Island. Mike Richter posted consecutive shutouts in games one and two, the first Ranger to do so since Davey Kerr back in 1940. The Rangers completely dominated in the four-game sweep. The Rangers dispensed of another Atlantic Division rival, the Washington Caps, in the Eastern Conference semis. Brian Leach scoring the game-winning goal late in Game 5, propelling New York to the Conference Finals for the first time in eight seasons. The New Jersey Devils in the Eastern Conference Finals for the first time since 1988. It took several trips through the Lincoln Tunnel to decide this one.